still working? Yep, it's working. All right, so our company, we're based in Walmart's Loblaws. We're across the province, uh, we're open seven days a week. Use us, we're awesome. What's the name of your company? Oh, right, that's a good one, Access Law. <laughs> uh, we're, I, I, sorry, I, I went I went flippantly through that because we're here all the time, but Access Law is based in Walmart's Loblaws. We're open seven days a week. We're one of the largest real estate advance operations in Ontario. Uh, we do thousands and thousands of transactions. We have a lowest price guarantee on our quotes. Uh, and uh, many of you are using Access Law presently, and for that, I sincerely thank you. And hopefully, you found that the quality lives up to the blatant assurances that I give every time I'm up here. So, to move on and get into detail, uh, we have a whole bunch of awards, a whole bunch of locations, including, by the way, Shanghai. I'm pointing out we now have our uh, Chinese locations that are starting. So, we have Shanghai, we're opening up in Beijing and Guangzhou, um, specifically for sign up appointments because still we have so many Chinese clients that are actually coming in. These are not real offices like the other offices. These are literally Ontario lawyers that are just sitting out there stamping, but it allows for ID and people who cannot leave China for whatever reason to actually be part of our process. Okay, domestic taxation. I'm dividing up the pro process today into domestic and foreign taxation because there's now two different types of taxation we need to know about. Let's start with HST. HST is always an issue because um, everyone sees the HST is included in Form 100, right? Everyone always sees that HST line, and then you have to choose whether or not it's going to be included in or excluded from. And what you need to know about HST for the perspective of residential properties is that they are called exempt surplus. So if it is, and I'll explain what that means, if it is residential property resale, there is never tax. What does that mean? That means a single unit, no HST is applicable. That means two units, no HST is applicable. That means three units, is no HST is applicable. And this is going to blow your mind. That means 100 units, no HST is applicable. So you know those giant buildings in the sky that you see, the multi-res buildings, that we think is commercial because commercial agents deal with those things? Those aren't commercial properties. Those are still exempt surplus under the Income Tax Act. And therefore, they are exempt from HST. Why do we write HST as included in? We write that because it is exempt as long as it's been used as a residential purchase. How do we know that the seller, how does the buyer know that the seller hasn't conducted business affairs from there? That they haven't uh, hived off a portion for their own office use and then they're, they're sitting there meeting clients and doing physiotherapy or whatever it is. Sorry, that's embarrassing that my phone is going off. There we go. How do we know? We don't. And so when we say HST is included in the purchase price, what we are actually saying is, hey, seller, you know what you use this for. You take on the risk. It's not my business. As long as this is residential property, it is exempt. Now let me tell you something else. Because then, most of you are, are most of you residential agents presently? One day you'll get a commercial deal. You're going to flip out about HST. You are going to be beside yourself. You're going to be saying, oh my god, I remember residential is exempt, but I remember commercial has HST. Well, commercial does have HST, so everything else has HST applicable. But there is a process that we are able to invoke, provided both clients, both seller and buyer, are what are called registrants under the Income Tax Act. So you guys all are probably registrants, right? You pay HST. You make over 30000 a year. You have to be registrants. And if you have a GST number, and if the seller has a GST number, GST. we can do, sorry, HST. HST, did I say GST? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. If both of you have H, I've been doing this for a while. <laughs> if both of you have HST numbers, then we can do something called zeroing out, which means that even if it's payable, it is not transferable on the conclusion of a transaction, okay? What you need to know from a cash flow perspective, it's not going to affect your clients in a commercial context, and in a residential context, HST is not applicable at all. Does that make sense? And do you understand now on the residential forms why you're always writing HST is included in the purchase price? It's because the only person who may not make it included in is the seller themselves by virtue of their conduct. Therefore, they should be responsible for it. Is that, is that clear? OK. Um, HST. Does, yes? What about on a residential building lot? 
So that would not be that would not be deemed to be exempt surplus, but that would be zero rated, which is what I was referring to before. If it is if it is deemed zoned, sorry, if it is zoned residential, you're saying if it's zoned yeah, residential, it's residential if it's not. zoned residential, then um, it would not be applicable. The HSP would not be applicable on that. You could be exempt. Yeah. They are collecting the HSP on the vacant lot. They are on no, res a zoned residential yeah. yes, yes, vacant yes, lot. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. Interesting. Okay. So then, in that case, please don't take my word on that. I'll get back to you. I'll take your cards afterwards, and I'll give you. I'll I'll, I'll look into it for you because that's news to me. But regardless, exempt surplus being places where people live definitely is exempt from HST 100% of the time. Now, HST, you'll note I said it's on used residential. It is not exempt on new construction, right? New construction, it is applicable. But it turns out that the builders always include a price that includes that HST in any event such that the end amount that is being paid on as stated in the purchase price is the purchase price plus the HST minus the HST rebate, which they claim you will qualify for. I've given a talk just last week here or last uh, two or three weeks ago just about how the HST rebate works. I went into some detail about that. It's actually here. So if you guys want to see how the HST rebate works, as part of new builds, it's actually on your internal portals, and there was a huge presentation on it as well. But effectively, above four hundred and fifty thousand dollars in purchase price, the HST rebate is twenty-four thousand dollars, meaning that you are getting back twenty-four thousand and agreeing to give it to the builder when you are signing a new build agreement. And it is for that reason that the builder is extending to you a product at the price that is stated. So to use math. $500,000 is the purchase price. The amount of money, that amount of money includes the HST, but has a $24,000 component where you're going to get that from the government and give it to the builder. Builder will result in getting $524,000 total. Dollars. You will only pay $500,000. Does that make sense? Does everyone get that ridiculous math? And if you're wondering why it's done that way, because that's not the way we ordinarily interact with HST, the way we ordinarily interact with HST is like a candy bar. You buy a candy bar for a dollar, you pay a dollar thirteen, right? That's the way it works. This cockamamie way that the builder has actually come up with designing this HST, where they've already reduced that and accordingly have given you a lower price, is specifically because of supply and demand, so that the builder is able to say to you, thank you very much, your purchase price appears lower. And it is lower as long as you qualify. They could theoretically charge you five hundred twenty-four thousand. You could separately apply for the rebate, charging you five hundred thousand. Does that make sense? Okay. So, HST is not in the residential context is not applicable. Apparently, it is on vacant lots. I'll look into it. I, I actually haven't transferred a vacant lot. I've transferred commercial lots. Only is if the seller if the seller is has one lot he bought for himself, he was going to build a home. Then it's then it's there is no HST, but if he's in the business of selling lots. Yes. Then it's a, if he's done it more than one time, Revenue Canada. But, the, but, the but part of Canada. the reason for that is that the lot is new. It's not res it's not resale, right? Like at that point, what you've done is you've severed a lot. It's a brand new sale. You, no, no, no. They're done sometimes on on an old one. On MLS. It's so the street that there's one if, lot. If it is the case that it is applicable, and I'm ready to just accept that it is, it would still be zero rated. Meaning that at the end of the day, as long as both parties were registered, the buyer and the seller, it wouldn't be paid in the first instance. How does that work? Can you give us a little bit of uh, inform that? Like if they are both registered, what happens that they don't have to pay? The, lawy the lawyers themselves, that's right, it is self assessed, and the lawyers themselves have statutory declarations stating that all of them are registrants. There is a form provided by the CRA that both parties sign, and at that point, there is no need to transfer it. It is fine if it comes in ITC. For one of the parties, an income tax credit. In other words, government is losing that money. No, no, no. The government, the government is able to claim the money, but they claim it back from the income. So the idea is that the purchaser is going to be using this for to make money themselves, and as a result, it's going to be reduced from that particular revenue stream later on. Oh God! All right, let's not have tech issues. All right, let's boom. Okay, then there's municipal taxation. Let's talk about that. So when you buy a property, 
you have to pay ongoing municipal tax. Now, it is the case that most people don't understand where municipal tax comes from. And for you guys, when you're doing residential deals, oftentimes you want to just verify the authenticity of the taxes that are on MLS. Did you know that you could do that very easily? You could do it very easily. First of all, if you go to your public records, you know, using MLS, if you go to public records, you'll see that there is actually the assessed taxes of a property, right? So it tells you what impact the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation is valuing your property at in a given year. If you take that assessment, has everyone fooled around with public records and they know what I'm talking about? If you take that public record and multiply it by the mill rate, you'll get the taxation per year. So really all that's missing from your knowledge is what is a mill rate? And a mill rate is, every municipality has a different mill rate. This is Toronto's mill rates from 2016. Okay, it's actually dropped down. It's now at 0.68. But the total tax rate on a residential property is 0.75. And what that means is that you take the assessed value by MPAC, let's say it's $3 million, and you multiply it by 0 0.0075, and that's the annual tax. And so if you look at a tax rate and you say, this looks fishy to me, this doesn't seem right, you should be simply going into this great thing called Google, you just go to Google, type in mill rate Toronto, this little chart will pop up, you figure out what your appropriate mill rate is, you then go to your public records, you figure out what the assessed value of the property is, you multiply the two together, and you can call BS on the seller if in fact it is BS. Make sense? So. I don't know why agents don't know about the mill rates, but it is very important that you actually fool around with this because this is the basis of taxation is not something random. It, it, this happens. And by the way, this is why every single time MPAC does a reassessment of your property, which happens every four years, you should be fighting it every single time, right? Because you can't control this multiplier. You can control what is being multiplied by the multiplier, which is your purchase price. And you should be always trying to fight it. And there's a whole bunch of lawyers, by the way, who will immediately write you and say, hey, it's assessment time. If we are successful in fighting, we'll take half of the savings that we get you. And you should be saying, if you're not going to do anything else, you should be saying yes to those things every time. Because they'll only, if they're successful, will, you, will they get paid. And you will manage to lower your bill. So just keep on challenging those things. That's part of your job as citizens and homeowners. OK. Now let's talk a bit about this is not to do with real estate, but it is to do with capital gains. And we have to understand how income tax generally works before such time as we're actually able to address capital gains. Because realtors particularly, and at their OREA sessions, are taught about capital gains up until the point that something is included in income. Um, and it's really quite important that we actually have an understanding first of how to actually do the entire transaction to the dollar value. And I'll do that with you in a minute. But these here are currently the 2018 taxable income. By the way, you may want to buy it when you see that, particularly if you know that above 183,000, but six years ago was at 43%, and now it is at 54% tax. What does this mean? This means that if you are someone who, through salary or otherwise, has earned $220,000, you are going to pay 54% tax to the government, that is the combined Ontario federal amounts, for every extra dollar that you earn. Okay. By the way, the reason income splitting works is if you have a spouse who, if you've owned over 220, but your spouse has earned zero, well, if you give your spouse a dollar, they will only have to pay 20% of that money, as opposed to giving you a dollar where you have to pay 54%. That's what income splitting is between spouses. You have a lower income. Let's put more income into you because we have a graduated system of tax. Does this make sense? Okay. That's important because capital gains tax is based on the income calculations that we've just talked about. Now, let's be clear. Let's talk about what capital gains are. So how many of you have been to that poison nest of, um, of Seth's, uh, Chudley's apple farm? one that has like the apples that are completely white and they say oh no that's just wax not pesticide but then you shake violently and every time you have an apple okay anyways <laughs> sorry i'm paid they didn't check now so chuglies so. <laughs> so with chuglies uh if you go ahead and you buy apples from them okay and you buy a sack of apples which unbelievably by the way cost 22 dollars and 70 cents that's actually why i'm angry um which unbelievably cost 22 dollars and 70 cents 
That $22.70, what is that to Chudley's? Is that a capital gain or is that income? It's income. That's what they do. They're designed to sell apples. Directly north of Chudley's apple farm, there is a Christmas tree farm. They plant trees, they wait four years, and then they sell trees. And when they sell you a Christmas tree, is that capital gains or is that income? Okay, that's income. Now, one day, Mr. Chudley decides he's sick of selling apples and he cuts his trees down to the ground and he sells the lumber. The sale of that lumber is that it's the same thing as that they're both selling trees. The Christmas guy is selling trees and Chudley is selling trees. But Mr. Chudley is now trapped down his apple trees. When he sells that lumber, what is that? Capital gains or income? Capital gains. Because, the, because what matters is what is it that you actually did? Was this something that produced income for you or was the purpose the sale of this in the first place? Okay. And so even though it's the same product, even though both of them are trees, they're taxed differently. And as a result, it's always going to be more advantageous to have, and we're going to talk about what, how the taxing works, but it's always more advantageous to have a capital gain over an income uh, sale. And we'll talk about how that apl applies to real estate in a second. But what it is, is 50% of whatever it is the sale takes place is then included as part of your income. So as an example, with a purchase of a sale of a property, let's say that it's a property that has hosted tenants for 10 years. Okay, what's the tenant income that comes in? That's income. That's that's the apples. And when you sell the product, you're selling. You chop down your apple tree, right? That's what it is. You're now selling the house. So if the original price of a property of a tenanted property was four hundred thousand, and the sale of the property is five hundred thousand, and the profit, assuming no other deductions, is a hundred thousand. I'm trying to keep it simple. Then the capital gains tax payable is fifty percent of the profit, at fifty thousand. Going back, that 50000 is included as part of your marginal tax rates. This is how capital gains works. So let's say you're in the top tax bracket. You're going to take that 100000 you're going to put it in at 54%, which means that you're going to have to pay $27,000 tax to the government, which sure as heck is better than paying 54% of 100000 which is what would happen if it was income tax. Does that make sense? Yes. Simon, are they 100% taxable capital gain though? Are they 100% taxable capital gain? So, okay, let's talk about that. So, uh, this was also part of last time's presentation. But assignments are something that are being cracked down on. What matters, according to the CRA, is the intention of the taxpayer at the time that they engaged in the agreement of purchase and sale, not when they did the assignment. If you purchase the assignment, if you purchase the agreement of purchase and sale with the intention of either renting it or living there, and there was a bona fide change of intent that took place such that you are now selling, then it will be a capital gain. If not, there will be both income tax and HST applicable on the balance on the profit plus the return of deposits. How can you prove your intent? So Proving intent is something for which real estate lawyers make a lot of money because the CRA is constantly saying, thank you very much, it's income tax. Why? Because then they get $54,000. And we're constantly saying it's capital gains. Why? Because then we only have to pay $27,000. And the answer is, it's based on the taxpayer's intention. Intention is discerned through their previous activities and through proof that can be assembled. So if you have gone ahead and assigned four units that year, you're done. They're going to say, thank you very much. You're clearly doing this. If you've done this four times in the past three years, okay, you're done. If you have an email to your agents basically saying, hey, I really want to negotiate my assignment provisions. Let's do this. My intention is to assign. And, and you're compelled before the court to provide evidence. There you go, right? Like it's about your intention. Whereas if you're doing it once in a lifetime, you'll probably get away with it because it's hard to prove. If well, We had an instance where someone was challenged. It was their second assignment in the year. The first assignment was a bona fide change of intent to the second condo. The second condo they sold, they had a really good reason. The New York School of Medicine gave them an actual letter stating, thank you very much, you've been accepted. The very next day it was listed or the very next day, they engaged a real estate agent, so we had a listing agreement showing the day after the acceptance. And then they went ahead and they assigned it two weeks later. 
Okay, so the CRA said, okay, we understand this. This makes this makes sense. If you get married and you move jurisdictions and you're able to show that, that's proof that there was obviously a change in life. And all these things are the things that you would be providing to the CRA specifically to get them to accept the capital gain over income tax. Make sense? Yes. Why would you be uh, which is beyond the department? Because they call you the developer, and if you are the developer, then you're the developer of a new, I'm not saying it makes sense, I'm just telling you what they do. Believe me when I say the CRA doesn't necessarily need to make sense, they're just going to do it. They call you the developer if you are intending to assign, and as the developer, you have to pay HST on the full purchase price, which is the profit difference, because that hasn't been accounted for, it's part of the original price. And the return of the deposit is just them kicking in the nuts because they're the CRA and they can. I, there's no reason for it. That's just what they do. Because that's your own money, actually. I got it. 100%. You should not be paying it. I'll let you argue with them. Right now, I'm just telling you that that's what they do. Yeah. On the example that you have here, uh, do you say that includes the rental for the, the years past? Well, no, 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 that has nothing to do with it. You're paying that on an annualized basis, the income from the property. That's just income tax. Okay. How would you, for a different example, if you own the property from day one, then you start leasing it after five years, and you're selling it after five years again, what would you assume the uh, purchase price would be at that time? So, what you're, if you don't mind, I'm going to just rephrase your question. Yeah. What you're saying is, what happens with a property where you've been living there for yeah. five years and then you convert it to a rental property? Now, implicit in that discussion is the understanding that if it is a primary residence, if it's your house and it is a primary residence, it is exempt from taxation. But we know it's not exempt from taxation if it's a rental property. There are professionals out there that will work with your accountant to ascribe a value predicated upon research to the property at the time that it converted from your home to a, a rental, such that the true adjusted cost base, that's what the term is in tax, the adjusted cost base is assessed at year five, as opposed to year zero. There are professionals whose job it is to do that. We do a letter of opinion at agents. <laughs> you can, but that won't be reliable for the well, CRA. Uh, I'm not saying you. I'm not saying you haven't done it. I'm saying to you that the CRA wants value assessors, and that's their gold standard. Real estate agents are not seen by the CRA. We've seen this many, many times. Are not seen by the CRA as the positive proof in the same way that value assessors are. But that's not to say that you, we, we assemble the opinions of real estate agents as well because you guys are involved in the market and that is fundamentally something we gives us proof. I'm just saying it's not necessarily 100%. The way when a client asks us to do it. Yeah, for sure, because you're able to give a value. But your, your job is to sit there and say, this is what I think your property can sell for. Don't ever say this is what it's worth. Say, this is what I think you can sell for. Your job is to say what it can not what your your job is not to tell people what the property is worth. Your job is to tell people what it can sell for or what they should be paying. That's your job. Right? There's is a difference. So always make sure in your letters to say, no, I, I believe the property can sell I for have this. A disclaimer on, I have an official letter of opinion. Fine, but use that term that I just yeah. gave you. Thanks. Yeah. Let's say you buy a property for two hundred thousand and then you live in for five years and last year you decided to rent out it was worth five hundred. You sell today and it's at 450 now. Okay. Um, so. So you buy it for 500 and you sell for 450. You buy 200. You buy 200. Yeah. Last year was valued at 500. Yeah. And this year it's at 450 sell. So you've been renting for the past year when and you start renting once the property was at the highest and now it's down in value. Okay. So what you're basically saying, if I can just summarize, is what happens if you buy at 500? Because you're saying what happens in my adjusted cost base? You're saying let's say I started renting when it was at its height. So let's say that I bought a property when it was at its height and then it went down to 450, right? So that's called the capital loss. And the capital loss in tax can be written off as against future capital gains, not income gains, capital gains. Capital gains can be written off as against capital losses, income gains can be written off as against income losses. Make sense? So that's the answer. And you can carry that forward indefinitely now. It used to be seven years. Yeah? Um, I'll give you a real life example. Go for it. Um, so my client purchased from a new home builder. I negotiated in the contract that wasn't standard in the contract and assignment clause. To be honest, the intent was eventually they were going to sell this property and it was going to be rented for about a year. Um, so let's fast forward about a year and a half later. Uh, I sell the property. It was tenanted for the whole year and a half. 
Uh, however, my client um, sold it because they um, were notified of you know pending retirement. So basically, they were given Understood. a package from the company, and now they're retiring. If my client can prove that they had the retirement package given to them before they sold the property, and that was uh, the reason why they wanted to sell it. Yep. Um, would the fact that I negotiated the assignment clause at the beginning? Negotiating an assignment clause is not fatal at all. That could just be prudence. Right. That, the, the CRA doesn't look at that and say, the fact that you negotiated this means that we're gonna treat this as income tax. Right. Don't worry about that. Because it was handwritten in versus a standard. Form. Don't worry about that. It, it speaks to the fact that you may have been thinking mm -hmm. defensively, yeah. Yeah, of course. But but it doesn't mean that you didn't have an intention of living there. Right. Uh, you, you'd have to speak to a tax lawyer if it gets challenged, but I wouldn't think that I would be losing sleep over that at, at all. Um, okay. So, CCA depreciation. Now, this is kind of where investors really start going in. I need. This is where people glaze over. This this is where I know you guys know capital gains and income. I know you know. By the way, you're welcome to take pictures, but. You should know presentations are always emailed to you after you attend, so you, you'll get the whole thing. Okay, and I, we don't hide this. CCA depreciation is where people's eyes gloss over, but actually, it's where the details matter. The reason that these people won't be selling these multi-res properties is because of this, because of this, not capital gains only. So, you'll remember this from some ORAA course that you took way back. So, I'm going to remind you if you don't mind. So, if you purchase a building, the first thing that you do is you allocate a value to the building. You say, okay, of the million dollars that I paid, $800,000 is the building value, $200,000 is the land value. Land does not depreciate. Just land doesn't depreciate. Buildings do depreciate. Okay? And what that means is that every year, for any asset, the Income Tax Act literally has a list of what you can depreciate an asset at. So a computer can depreciate at 33% per year. You get it for three years. Land depreciates, except for the first year where there's something called the half year rule and I'm not going to go into it. Land depreciates at 4% per year. Not land, sorry. Buildings, 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 sorry. So let's talk about what that means. And assuming year one is actually year two, because I don't want to go into the half year rule. So $800,000, 4% of $800,000 is $32,000. So let's say I make $60,000 in income that year. If I make $60,000 in income that year from tenants, the first thing I'm allowed to do is write off my expenses. Let's say that's $10,000, so $50,000. Now I have to pay $50,000 of tax. It's now going into my 54% tax rate. But I can use a different expense. I can use a depreciation expense. I can use this $32,000 and subtract that from the $50,000. And in doing that, I will only pay tax on $18,000 that year. Hugely advantageous to me. That $32,000 is then subtracted from the $800,000, meaning that the remaining value of the building is $768,000. And therefore, the next year, I'm doing 768,000, I'm multiplying that by four, and that's my depreciation value, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Really good, really nice. And if you have a multi-res unit where you're buying it for $18 million, 4% of $18 million is a significant sum every single year, significant. In fact, could someone do 4% of $18 million for a second? I just wanna know what the number is. Just, I wanna give you a practical example. 120,000? 700. 720,000. So let's just say it's a million dollars that you're saving every single year. A million, a million, a million, a million, and you've owned these buildings for 30, 40 years. It's not a million, but it's on a declining scale. But let's say that you've managed to rack up $15 million in savings. Not unrealistic. That's how much the building has depreciated. But lo and behold, the accounting gimmick that we've used is not real because someone comes and offers you $30 million for your building. So let's assume that you put no money into the building. You're now selling it for $30 million. You purchased it for $18 million. It's a $12 million gain. That's a capital gain. $6 million of that is going to be included at 54%, assuming you're selling it personally. And so what you're thinking as an agent is, okay, if you do this, you are going to net 
um, approximately, so I'm going to have to pay 54% of $6 million, so it's going to be about $4 million, so you're going to net $8 million. But what the multi-res people are thinking is, no, 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 I'm not going to net $8 million, because I have this beautiful thing called recapture. You remember all of that depreciation value that I've taken, which here is $32,000, but we just worked out can easily be a million, and a million every single year? Well, we had depreciated wrongly, because it turns out that when we had said the building value was declining, it wasn't declining, it was going up. And so, hey, the government wants it all back. So it's not that they're making six million bucks or nine million bucks, it's nine million bucks, but now they have to go ahead and repay millions of dollars in recapture. And no one thinks about recapture as a tax. You guys aren't thinking about it in your, I know you aren't, because I've been a real estate agent and I know how we think. We're talking about capital gains, but if you really want to show someone you understand what's up, talk to them about recapture. It's a real factor for multi res It's a real factor for retail. By the way, what's the best asset class to own? Just out of curiosity, come on. So let's just go through for one second. What's the best asset class? This is not tax, but it's interesting. What's the best asset class? Oh, I don't know. Deals. Well, the best asset class is the one that has the lowest cap rate, right? Mm -hmm. OK, what's the lowest cap rate? Yes, Sorry? multi res it's multi res Those giant buildings that look like crap, that smell like tuna fish, that is the best value. Why? Because it's recession proof. If the market turns down, that income stream remains, right? Because people rent more. What's the second best? Second best. Class A retail, like Walmart's. Because when recessions take, well, this used to be the case. Now there's Amazon, so who the hell knows? But it used to be the case that Class A retail, like Walmart, would be the second best. Because when recessions hit, people shopped more at Walmart's. There's a value, right? Followed by Class A office. Followed. There's this whole penalty. You can just arrange the, the, the cap rates. Everyone understand what, what a cap rate is? I mean, I know some yeah. of you are residential. But yeah? I have two questions. Well, hold on, hold on. I'm on a roll here. I'm on a roll. Just one second. What's the worst? What's the worst asset class? If multi res is the best, what's the worst asset class? What's the one that has the cap rate of 8 or 9% here in Ontario or Toronto, at least? Hotels. Because when things go bad, what happens to the income stream from a hotel? Torpedoes. So really, all that we're doing, we can claim, all you need to do when you're thinking about these things, and I, I know that this is a bit of a tangent and an offside, but when you're thinking about income streams, you have to think about the stability of the income stream when you're dealing with investors. And the stability of the income stream is dependent upon what happens if the economy goes south. And you can then figure out why cap rates are what they are. It's really interesting when you start looking at the real estate world from the perspective of proper cap rates and understanding this dynamic that's at play. Sorry, I interrupted and this had nothing to do with tax. Yeah. Actually, the first question is about the capital gain, the loss and gain. Yeah. If I have two investment property, both of them tenanted, in one of them I lose money and one of them gain money. If calculate the tax, each one individually or together combine. Well, it depends. Who owns this? It's a person that's owning this? I own. So both you'll, of you'll them. have a loss from one, you'll have a gain from the other. And yes, they, uh, they, they, they offset one another through the yes. same entity. Because you're not filing different tax returns per property. You're filing a single tax return yes. for the owner. So yes, they would offset. The loss would write off as against the gain. Yes. Even different probability. Even different properties. I bought for sale. Sale is the same. If I rent it, it is income tax. That's right. And if it's sale, it is capital gain. That's right. And if, you, one have, of if them, you have a capital gain and a capital loss, they would offset each other. Yes. Would, Even uh, over different years, by the way. Capital losses can be carried forward. How, how many years? It, it used to be seven, but now it's unlimited. Oh, it's unlimited. Yes. Okay, good. And for the intention, Mother, you shouldn't have capital losses, especially in the rising real estate market. <laughs> no, no. For the for the tenant, maybe. Okay, all right, all right, fine. Okay. Fine. Uh, for the for intention to leave, I'm going to buy a house. My intention to live over there, even I change my driving license address, my bank account address, I live over there for one month, but in one month I decide to sell so it. See, the CRA says it's that one money. year is a it's not that it's a gold standard. One year seems to be what they are deeming reasonable. It's never been written one year. It seems to be. Anything less than a year is challengeable. You can justify, but who wants? To, who the hell wants to justify? 
you don't want to attract their attention. The whole idea of tax is don't hit the bear. So great, fantastic. You prepare your stuff, wait till it comes in, and have fun dealing with them for eight months while you're worried as anything and they're sitting there trying to come down on you like a ton of bricks because that's what they do. You don't want that. You want to sit there and understand how to be compliant so that you don't ultimately have to deal with this. But did this go off? Aww. Sorry. Can I ask another question? Sure you can. I think <laughs> <laughs> everything you are explaining today it is about the permanent residence in Canada, not non-Canadian. I non have not yet started to deal okay. with the NRST, which I would theoretically be getting to right about now if it wasn't saying shutting down <laughs> on the screen. So Sorry. we're just going to wait for us. Oh, can someone, can someone do me a favor? Can someone just go get Marty? Because I don't know the password to getting into the computer. I don't know how to do this. Um, so yes, Guys, could, could one other one person just run down and get Marty because yeah. I'm going to need to log back in. Yeah. Before you repay that registration, uh, how do they differentiate between them? Because most of the, let's say the uh, the value that went up was in left. Well, not most, but a lot of them. Right. So 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 the, so the, the determination of land and building would actually be done firstly in year one by your account, right? right. At your, whenever it is later on, there are professionals whose job it is to do that particular assessment, and your accountant will know who they are. They're just magical people who appear, and you know they, they do the job. Oh yeah, money. you absolutely, you absolutely can. You can say, hey, thank you very much. Land value has gone up more than the building value. Therefore, you're asking, you're ascribing with this, but it won't really matter. Most people don't have that argument because values have gone up so much. That regardless, it's clear that the building has maintained its value. All the building needs to do is maintain the value it had previous, not go up in value in order for you to have recapture. So it's 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 not all that relevant. Listen, well, are you guys happy that at least Windows 7's premium will be updated, protected <laughs> against the latest malware? Um, I think the next part of the presentation, if I'm not mistaken, was. Um, Well, I don't remember what it was, but I'm going to start with, I guess, the foreign buyer's tax because we, it's 1046. So I think I had other taxes to talk about. Sorry, guys. I, I, I apologize. It's, I know mine does it too. It just does it automatically? Yeah. No, wait, no. That's if you want the uh, But I pushed postpone. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. I oh, I pushed 10 minutes. Oh, Jesus. Doug Ford getting Doug Ford's uh, campaign said he's going to get rid of the foreign buyer tax. He said he's going to get rid of the foreign buyer tax. The paper this morning, yeah. Okay, well, whatever. Is that a Canadian thing or a provincial thing? It's a provincial. It's right? a provincial, it's provincial thing. thing. Yeah. So he said this morning in his campaign that's on the Brilliant. Why do you say that? Hey guys, I'm back. Uh, if, if I'm asked why he's going to say anything over the next couple of months, I'm just going to duck and cover. That's my, that's my, that's my response. Why do you say it's brilliant? You don't think it's a good idea to get rid of it? Oh, when I said brilliant, I meant I, I have. Well, I have absolutely no clue. I have no idea why he's saying anything. We we don't know what the income is. We don't know anything. I'll tell you straight out. NRSD was done to guard as against Chinese investment. Plain and simple. We don't want to claim it's Chinese investment, but it's Chinese investment. Uh, and Chinese investment in the Ontario market is significant. That doesn't mean it's bad. Um, I, lost in this whole discussion about Chinese investment is whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, but anyways, it's, it's interesting to hear that he's actually it's saying it's on his platform. Okay. We're now fully protected. Right? It's very exciting. Fully fully updated. We're, we're, we're so updated me. We're so good. <laughs> Okay, well, the Russian hackers it. tried, but yes, we, yeah. we, we put up our defenses no. over volume. Can I add to my answer about buyers on the future? Yeah, yeah. Bitcoin, 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 B
So back to the fun. So you get rid of all the evidence. Right. 100%. <laughs> oh, also at the end of the day, we burn everything. The whole building goes up. <laughs> Just because we're, we light fire. Sure. It has nothing to do with cyber security. It's like, all right. <laughs> So. Yeah, there we go. Oh, this actually gives me the opportunity to speak for my firm again. It's, uh, it's good. All right, thanks very much. No problem. Income tax, capital gains, CCA depreciation. Ah, oh, okay, we were on foreign tax. Okay, let's turn to foreign tax. So, new stuff, non-resident speculation tax, NRST. Okay, now the first thing to note is that Chinese investment, oh, okay, I'll, I'll pretend, foreign investment is actually wanted in certain areas. And you should understand what's motivating Chinese buyers. I was just in Shanghai, and I go to China pretty frequently, and I was just in Shanghai about a month or two ago, and the internal rate of return on capital there is 3% per month. There is nothing that is enticing Chinese money to leave China except two things. One is the fact that there is an expression that says it's not real money until it's out of China. In other words, people don't feel that the money is secure. And two is the idea that there's immigration that may be associated with Chinese money. That is to say, you can buy passports uh, through proper investments. It used to be the case until March, coincidentally, the very same time the NRST was put in, that you could buy Canadian passports through proper account. Come on, man. I didn't do anything about it. Just need to refresh it. Um, it used to be the case that until March of last year, the very same time that the NRSP came in, you were able to actually invest in capital assets of Canada, and that would count towards your citizenship papers. And in March, the federal immigration minister went ahead and changed the law such that now we are merit-based for immigration. That is to say, if you're an engineer or if you have AI intelligence or anything else, those are gonna be your credits. You know the only place that hasn't changed? Um, two places. One, Montreal and Quebec. They contain their own immigration policy. If you're wondering why Montreal's market is flying right now, it's because Chinese money can buy passports in Montreal and not in Toronto or Vancouver. Nothing to do with the NRST. Secondly, it is, because, it is in the northern parts of the provinces, anywhere where people do not ordinarily habitate. And you'll note that if you go north of the Golden Horseshoe area, Chinese investment is welcome, particularly in the mining space, particularly in the raw mineral space. We're trying to encourage asset acquisition and we're trying to encourage residential uh, construction up there. So you'll note that it actually only applies to the Golden Horseshoe area. It also, so what is it? It's a 15% tax. Yes. Is there a list of these areas that we can I can download or find? Yeah, online? so right from the so right from the oh, website. Oh, so what is everything that's highlighted? I didn't yellow. make this. I just literally copy and paste this. So everything right highlighted in yellow is what's considered. Yeah, yeah. So anything that that's all that's all subject to the NRST. Okay. Now, the NRST is a fifteen percent tax that is applicable on any property uh, that where there is a non-resident who is acquiring. A, even a 1% interest in that property. So if there is a non-resident, and we'll talk about what that is, and it is a conveyance that stems from after, after April 20th, 2017, so don't worry about your new builds that were signed in the past years, and it contains less than six residential units, and it's in that area that we just described, it can be subject to the NRST, and therefore 15% will be payable over and above the purchase price to the government. Okay? And it does not apply to commercial, industrial, or no. agricultural land. No. Okay, good. No. Okay. I don't know about vacant land, by the way. I have a feeling I'm going to get a question about that. I'm I don't sure. know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question for you as well, because I've uh, never come across it. A current uh, non-resident who owns a property currently. No problem. And is considering selling and be Purchasing, would they attract that tax? They would attract that tax. What's more, they would also face the second tax I'm going to talk to you about, which is the Section 116 withholding tax. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. All right. So everyone has to pay the NRST unless you are one of six, 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 five property groups. One is Canadian citizens. And Canadian citizens, to be clear, this has nothing to do with Canadian citizens for tax purposes, which is different than Canadian citizens. 
This is if you hold a Canadian passport. If you have a Canadian passport, you are a Canadian citizen. It is the immigration sense of the word. If you have a citizen, if you have a passport, you are exempt. If you are a permanent resident, you are exempt. If you are, I assume I don't need to define what a permanent resident is, but I probably do need to define what a foreign national operating under the Ontario Immigrant and Need Program is. You can sponsor people to come and work as long as you as an employer are giving them, and, and there's like, oh, you do it through the Ontario government, and then the Ontario government says, yes, we're going to accept this person into Ontario, and we give them a special registration number, and that's called the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program, and if someone has come in under the Ontario Immigrant Nominee Program, they're clearly not doing this just to invest in property, and therefore they can go ahead and they are exempt from the NRST. Refugees and protected people, I don't know too many people like that that ultimately buy property, though I would think protected people apply to diplomats. So if any of you have diplomats, I think protected people fall under that definition. And then spouses of any of these qualities, provided that the property is being used for personal use. Let me help you with the definition of spouse. Spouse is a screwed up definition in law. It's screwed up because the legislature was either drunk or high when they actually wrote the Family Law Act. Why? Because the definition of spouse in the Family Law Act is clearly defined as a married spouse. That's what it says. And then there is a completely different definition in the Family Law Act in Section 29 that defines spouse in a completely different way as people who have shared an underwear drawer for three years or who have a child together. That's what it is. And so these two different definitions wrestle with real estate agents because we all know land transfer tax, the applicable definition of spouse is someone who has lived together for three years or has a biological or adopted child. And similarly, for the purpose of NRST, the definition of spouse is not the married spouse definition of the Family Law Act, but rather the spousal definition of having lived together for three years or had a child together. So if you are a spouse, as defined in Section 29 of the Act, to any of these people and you're buying it for residential purpose, you're fine as well. Now, there are certain people who have to pay it to get it back. One person is someone who becomes a PR within four years of having paid it. They have to apply within 90 days, but you get it back. Two, an international student enrolled full time for at least two years in an approved institution at a campus located in Ontario. Approved institutions do not include high schools, but almost any place that has a campus in Ontario is an approved institution under the Ministry of Colleges and Universities Act. And a foreign national that has legally worked full time under a valid work permit in Ontario for at least one year after the date of acquisition. Those people are exempt. I'm going to ignore this because we're doing a lot of work today. Let's turn our attention to the withholding tax. This is the other tax that foreign buyers have to pay. Now, this is part of Form OREA 100, Section 17. And I know you guys, I know each and every one of you and how you practice. And each and every one of you has said the following thing to your clients on multiple occasions. Oh, let's not worry about the standard form. Let's turn our attention to Schedule A. Don't worry, it's just standard. I've done it. Everyone does it. Because who wants to read through 23 pages of legalese that you may or may not understand, particularly paragraph 10, 12, 14 of the Act, and 17. But it doesn't mean that it's not important. You don't cross it off. You don't say, well, I, this is all standard form. I'm crossing it off. It means something. And what it says here is that the seller promises that they are resident of Canada summarizing it for you, okay? We say not a non-resident, which is so screwed up. But what that means is you're a resident of Canada, okay? Now, any time a non-Canadian, sorry, I can, oh, it should say any time a non-Canadian. Ah, sorry about that. I did this very late. Okay, any time a non-Canadian sells taxable Canadian assets, um, the buyer has to pay the government 25% of the agreed purchase price. This is the way it works. If you sell a car, if you sell shares, if you sell real estate, and you are a non-resident for tax purposes now, not for citizenship, you can have a passport for tax purposes, then the buyer has to remit 25% to the government. Why? Well, let's go through an example. In a normal real estate sale, a property is purchased for $100,000. A property is sold for $250,000, and therefore the gain is $150,000. The capital gain is half of that. Right? We've gone through this, $75,000. And the tax payable at the highest tax bracket, which is 54%, is $40,500. Everyone gets that? We've talked about it already. 
Now, let's say you're a foreign residential real estate sale. There was a property in Oakville owned by an Arab sheik. Uh, it was sold for $32 million. And when it sold, the buyer paid $32 million to this Arab sheik, who took the money and ran back to his kingdom. He was a diplomat and never having paid any tax. The buyer did not secure what they needed to secure, and as a result, was responsible for 25% of the $32 million. Why does the CRA make the buyer responsible? Because they can't get at the seller now. The seller has gone. They fled. And so why do they choose 25%? Well, let's go through the math. We know how much is payable to the government in this particular transaction. Let's go through the same transaction using the 25%. $100,000 is what it's purchased for. The property is sold for 250. The government gets 25% from the buyer without a space. I'll fix that. And therefore, the tax actually owing is $40,500. But remember, the government is getting 25% of the actual sale price, the whole thing, not the gain. And so the foreign seller, so what they're actually getting from us is $62,500. That is for that is 25% of $250,000. Therefore, the foreign seller now has a $22,000 incentive to file its taxes because when it files its taxes, it's only going to still owe the 40,500. And because the government is holding 62,500, they will get that back. And now, even if they're out in Dubai, they have every incentive to go ahead and file the tax. Does that make sense? So the 22,000 goes to the seller. Uh, the, it will be returned to the, to the seller, seller after they file their tax. It's not the 25. No, no, no. The buyer has to take the 25% and remit it to, no, remit it to the government. They give it to the CRA. Then the seller can file its income tax and get back whatever is actually still owing. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Isn't the lawyer of the seller responsible that they are signing that he's a uh, resident on? Don't ruin my mojo. Come on, man. Okay. Go, uh, the next slide. It's a, so how do you actually comply? The buyer can withhold 25% and turn it over to the government. We've talked about that. Or two other things can happen. The buyer can prepay the tax owing, get a clearance certificate from the government and provide that to the seller. Say, thank you very much. The government is permitting this to take place. That happens often. Or the buyer can provide the seller with a statutory declaration stating that the buyer is a resident of Canada for tax purposes. And the seller, sorry, the buyer does not need to verify the authenticity. They need to verify the authenticity of the document, but not the veracity of the document. They need to make sure that the signature is real, but they don't need to make sure that the statement is true. They can't believe it to be false. But as long as they secure a statement from the seller stating, I am resident, don't worry, then that will be sufficient proof for the purposes of the CRA. They're saying that the seller is a resident. Number three is backwards. Oh, buyer can provide the seller with a space. See, this is why I shouldn't do this late at night. That the, sorry, that the seller is a resident. I'm sorry. Yes, my mistake. It shouldn't say buyer. It should say seller. That the seller is a resident. And if you get one of those three things, you can proceed with the sale and you're done. Now, why does this matter? This matters. So this is tax. It has to be paid. Why do I, as a seller's agent, care about this? And more importantly, will you please stop talking about tax? Answer, last slide, so yes to that last question. Better answer, you care because it could spoil your client's ability to close their deal, which means less sweet, sweet commission buckaroos for you. Um, think about this for a second. If you are putting aside 25, the seller, if the buyer is withholding 25% and the loan to value that you have for your mortgage is more than 75%, the seller will not assemble enough money to pay off the mortgage and transfer the property. Thus, if any of you know that you're dealing with a non-resident, the purpose, what I'm bringing up here, is please communicate with your buyer first, with the seller lawyer early. Tell them, say, this is a non-resident. You have work to do. And that's why we're paid the sweet, sweet, sweet $400 per deal. Then we got on it and we have to actually make sure that things are compliant. Okay? And that is us. Now, I'll just point out one thing, because I'm going to watch market. Um, this is our free legal support line for Royal Page agents exclusively. Um, and uh, this goes to a lawyer seven days a week uh, till 8 p.m. You can call anytime. It's usually me that picks up the phone, but if I'm away on holiday or something else, one of our other lawyers is answering. We are always available. We do status reviews in two hours' time. We do new build reviews in two hours' time. Any of you who have used us can attest to this. We get on these things immediately, and we have a lowest price guarantee on all of our quotes which is why we are so flipping awesome. What questions do you guys have? Yeah. 
actually, uh, I have a client, they came to Canada as, uh, as visitors, wife applied for the school and took the student visa. Because of the wife, husband took the work permit and opened mm -hmm. a business. Okay. Right now, what is the situation on them? They are resident of Canada or not for the tax purpose? They're, they're, oh, for the purposes of that They're 15%, I'm talking about. So the 15%, they qualify under two different things. So both of them have to, they have to, she's qualifying under number two and he's qualifying under number Sorry, three. right now she's finished the school. But she has at least two years? Oh, yeah. And it's been one year since the acquisition that he's been on an open work permit? Yes. So then there you go. You qualify under two and three. You know they don't pay tax? No, they, they have to pay it, but they get it back. Within four years? Within four years. You mean they have to stay here within four years? No, 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 no. What I mean is as long as she has two years at an approved institution at the campus in Ontario, whether before or after, no problem. And as long as that person has worked on an open work permit for a full year after having paid the tax, they can claim it back. Does it need to have PL card? No, I just showed you. Who knows it? Is the lawyer usually is involved? Well, wow, I hope so. No, 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 no. Generally, for the claim back, you could just go to the Ministry of Finance. The secret is I took all this directly. Here, so, so basically, an international student can easily buy a property. Sorry. So, an international student in number two can easily buy a property. Uh, an international student can easily buy a property as long as they have two years here in Ontario, or will have acquired two years, in which case they get it back. They will have to pay the tax. They'll have a cash flow issue. Yeah. They have to pay the tax, and they'll get it back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. If you say the foreign investor can also use the capital gain exemption. Do you mean the primary residence exemption? No, no. The, uh, the foreign investor, and there is a capital gain, uh, the, the capital gain exemption, the 50%, can they apply that to for them, or is it just for Canadian residents? I'm going to use that. Good question. Okay, so let me just make sure I understand. Sorry. So, so, so the, there's a foreign investor, right? Okay. And and he's paid the fifteen percent. No, no. I'm just saying, saying when you're calculating the the, you, the capital gains, yeah, right, and they use the fifty percent exemption. Oh, you're saying can they write off the fifteen percent? Right. Instead of paying you. Yes, just that paying would be you. you would be able to claim that as a cost of of purchase, I guess. I don't know. I, I, wasn't, I, I thought it was only like for Canadian residents. Which can well, it depends if you're paying Canadian off. tax. Like the very fact that you're not a Canadian citizen doesn't mean that you're not paying Canadian <laughs> tax. No so it, 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 I, I think I would add, defer that to a tax lawyer, like an actual tax lawyer that can delve into the books, because this is all very new for every one of us. Thank you very much. No Thank problem. You. Any other questions? Okay, so one other thing, guys, I'm going to ask. Um, if you um, have any interest in the will option that I was talking about, where we come here and we do wills for you guys, uh, it's either going to be Simon or myself. But if you want to speak to Simon, he'll take down your name and your number, and we're happy to do it for you or your spouse uh, and get them done. It's just something we're going to try to do for this brokerage as much as we do them for the other brokerages where it's a very successful program. Or it's just part of the free legal support. <laughs> I'm going to say yes until you test me on it. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Anything else about tax you've always wanted to know? Was that was that useful? Did that help? Very much. Yeah. Excuse me. Actually, I help if anyone is involved to the, any residential property. For example, I'm a real estate agent. My job, it is the real estate. If I buy something, doesn't matter, the capital gain doesn't apply to me if I have to pay income tax called business or renovation company if someone. I don't know which tax lawyer you're using, but. I'm talking you. about the capital gain. No, if you, I you, buy you some. No, the fact that you're a real estate agent, it doesn't, it doesn't change your intention. You're allowed to have a house, you're allowed to have capital gains, all these things. Don't get me wrong, if you're a real estate agent using your license to regularly acquire all of these things and flip them continually, then similar to anyone else who's not a real estate agent that starts doing it, your intention changes. But the fact that you're a real estate agent doesn't mean that you're not entitled to the same capital gains that someone who's not a real estate agent is entitled to. That doesn't change the law. Okay, yeah. I have a question. It's a form of one buyer. If they buy a property in Renteville, is it every year they have to file a tax? Yes. Yes, because you have to pay taxes on taxable Canadian property, and taxable Canadian property includes property which is contained within the Canadian jurisdiction. 
But they can they have they can write off what's been mingled. Yeah, they, 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 they can write it off, they can do whatever yes, absolutely. Okay. Well guys, thank you so much. Thank if you, you want to speak to Simon about Wills and thank you again for the time and the attention. We really want to